I want to talk a little bit about Serdi, which is one of my favorite libraries. Um, and, but before I go to that, I want to explain a little bit uh, about why I'm using this in the first place. Um, so I work for Sentry, which you might know, it's a crash reporting company. And I have secretly <laughs> introduced Rust into uh, uh, Sentry a long time ago, um, I think about 2015 when we first started using uh, Python modules um, extended from Rust code. So we, we wrote some stuff in Rust and then sort of used it from the rest of the Python ecosystem. And we built there a lot of the ingestion pipeline in Rust. And one of the things that you do a lot there is serializing and deserializing. So evidently, we use a lot of 30. Um, but um, we also have sort of a problem there, because like when we started using Rust, there was maybe not the best ecosystem around for some of the problems that you would typically have, particularly testing. And so one of the things that I wrote uh, specifically to address some problems there is this library called Insta, which is a snapshot testing tool. And it also internally uses uh, 30. Um, and so some of the stuff that's going on in this talk is uh, it's not directly coming out of Insta, um, but this is this is where a lot of this sort of originally took place. So some of the code that now lives in other libraries um, that I will actually go through in this talk started out really in this uh, in this Insta library. And so if you're into snapshot testing in Rust, um, you should look at this because uh, I think it's a quite a cool cool library that um, that you can actually use to 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 do some interesting test cases. Okay, so about thirty. So the, the talk is called Surdy Shenanigans, and it's basically about like using this in ways that's a little bit unorthodox. Um, I also wrote a blog post about this recently, which goes into very much the same, um, but I want to give it a little bit more flavor. Um, so Surdy is a serialization deserialization framework, and it's a little bit similar to, for instance, um, I'm, I'm not sure if it's similar to a lot of systems that exist, but it abstracts away some of the ways in which you reason about serialization and deserialization. Um, and so um, it, it exists since around uh, the first time compiler plugins became available in Rust. Um, and so it actually has quite a bit of history. And it's, it's quite flawed, I would say. It's awesome, but there, there are a lot of restrictions um, in there, which um, were OK at the time. But I think by now, we have figured out that maybe maybe some of it needs some improvements. Um, but despite all of those limitations, there's actually still a lot you can do. Um, but before I want to go into sort of ways in which you can abuse this, I want to sort of quickly go into uh, how it works at all, if you haven't used it yet. Um, there are two parts. 30 serialization, deserialization. So it's start with the first one. There are two kind of important traits. The first one is called serialize. And this trait basically defines how a type wants to be serialized. And there's a second trait, which is called serializer, which is basically a trait which um, is implemented by a thing that knows how to serialize uh, a serialize object. So for instance, a serializer would say, like, I know how to write ch uh, JSON. I know how to write YAML. Where a serialize knows, I know how to instruct a serializer to basically serialize myself. So in this very simple case, you have a, a, a point with um, two members, x and y. And you can basically implement serialize for point. Uh, serialize is a pretty basic trait. It doesn't have any lifetime to something associated. There's one method on it called serialize which takes um, a parameterized serializer, and it can do some stuff on it. Um, what's important here, and this is, I think, actually quite clever, is that the serializer uh, moves in, which means that the, the, the serializer is moved and consumed in the serialize method, which means that you can actually hold quite a bit of state on the serializer, which then at the end of it, it can move out. Um, so in this case, it's not evident what this does. Um, but I will show you an example later of why this is, is quite valuable. But um, here you can actually see that the serializer is instructed to serialize a, a struct of, called point. Uh, it has two members. And what the serializer returns in this case is, is kind of like a, a, a struct serializer substate object, um, which you then can say, like, hey, I want a field serialized, another field serialized, and then I want to end the whole thing where I am. And the end method then returns the end result that the serializer thinks should be returned. Um, most serializers don't return anything, so they will return void. Um, but you can actually 
you can actually have the serializer return some interesting data. <clears throat> and uh, we'll take advantage of this later. Because nobody really wants to write code like this, there's automatic support to automatically deriving this. Um, this pretty much generates the same thing as before. Um, but it's actually quite a bit of stuff you can do um, on this sort of automatic deriving system to customize this a little bit. <clears throat> so I already mentioned that consuming serializes is a really useful property. And the reason this is a useful property is because you don't have to produce bytes. Um, a lot of serializes will produce bytes. Um, in particular, everything that sort of is a wire format like um, YAML, uh, JSON, uh, even bin code, they will typically take a writer as sort of the input to the serializer and the serializer will hold the writer and then every serialized method will just write into the writer. Um, but you can also do more interesting things. Um, so here, for instance, this is straight out of originally Insta, but this is also what I use in Mini Chincha, which is a serializer. It's called a value serializer. <clears throat> and it actually produces an object. So instead of serializing into bytes, um, it returns um, a new value. In this case, it's like a, a value type. Uh, it's not called value. It's just an enum of a bunch of different variants. In this case, you can see like if it tries to serialize an i64, it actually returns a value that has an internal representation of i64. <clears throat> now, why is this useful? Well, it's useful because it can transform serializable things into different things. Um, so for instance, I don't want to like go too much into this because it's kind of hard to see. Um, but here you can basically see like this is this is still the same serializer from a value serializer. Um, and when you when when it wants to serialize a struct, so a type comes around that says like, hey, I'm a struct. Like I'm the point of two x and y coordinates. Um, the serializer here will actually return a serialized struct, which is sort of the internal sort of abstraction to how to serialize a struct. And again, it moves. <coughs> um, um, well, first it will produce this. So it will say like, hey, I have, I want to collect a bunch of fields into this. And so then the serialized struct implementation which is this one here. <clears throat> Whenever a serialized field is invoked, which is what we used earlier. So uh, you will see this here, right? So serialized struct returns the state. The state is actually this thing that we have over there. <clears throat> and then serialized field is being invoked, right? And so this is what we have here. So we actually say like, okay, I want to store the key. And then the value, which is again serializable, we will again go back into the value serialize and sort of um, effectively um, descend into, <clears throat> like recursively into the next kind of thing. And then we end this by producing a new value, which is now represented as a struct of all the fields. All right. So. This is basically an example of how a serializer doesn't actually have to create bytes. It can actually create a whole bunch of other interesting things. The next part after this is, oh, and what's important to notice here again is because this consumes, so the, the end of the, um, the end method on, on this uh, consumes, it means that you can um, move out the fields from, from, from the serialized struct helper. If, if it wouldn't be able to consume, it would just be uh, end mood self. You would have to do some other stuff, like maybe move out of an option. Uh, but this is quite convenient this way. Um, deserialization is a lot more complicated um, for two reasons. The first one is that the different formats in, zero, in 30. So I think everybody can quickly understand how serializing works. It's just it recurs through a structure, and it just writes some stuff. But in deserialization, there are different types in which you can deserialize. There are formats that are like JSON, where it's pretty clear what's coming your way. But then there are formats that are what's called non-self-describing. So these are formats that don't tell you what data is coming. You already have to know ahead of time what you get to expect. Um, and that because of this, 30 uh, has two different ways to deserialize. Um, I just want to go into the first one, which is the, the one that involves self, um, self describing inputs. So, self describing format is basically a deserializer that, whenever it parses a token, can determine from the token what it is. Like in JSON, for instance, if a string, if the double quotes, then you know it's going to be a string. If, the, if it starts with the number 
um, then you know it's going to be a number. It's going to be an integer or it's going to be a float. And the way this is implemented in, in 30 is that you basically create this visitor and then you implement all the visit methods which you want to support. So in this case, we have a Unix timestamp type and we implement two variants to it. The first one is a U64 variant. So if the deserializer is invoked with uh, U64, it will directly create timestamp. If it's passed string from the deserial deserializer, then it will try to parse it um, with the uh, chrono the time parsing function. And then again, do the same. And sort of the trick here is this deserialize and deserialize any at the end. Um, this basically means deserializer, please give me one sort of token and then pass this to the visitor. Um, but the challenge here is that not every single format actually supports this. And I'll show you a little bit later why this is a, why this is a problem. But basically, this means that this deserializer only works with JSON data, for instance, or, or YAML. But it wouldn't work with bin code, for instance. Um, why? Because then you have to already tell the deserializer what you're going to expect. Like, for instance, I know it's going to be integers. So you have to tell it, I want to deserialize an integer. I don't want to deserialize whatever comes next. Um, the second sort of more complicated part here is that time uh, lifetimes are involved. So one of the things you can do, and not a lot of people do do this because it's complicated, is that you can deserialize and you can borrow out of the deserializer's um, input. So if you think, for instance, JSON, um, a lot of strings don't involve um, unescaping. And if strings don't involve unescaping, you could basically take a slice of memory of where the input string is, and you can sort of borrow out of this without having to clone the string. Um, that's what this lifetime is for. And for some formats like bin code, it's actually relatively useful. Um, but in a lot of other cases, it's very hard to support because the input format doesn't support it. Um, the Pretty obvious thing is that the deserializer can only ever produce um, one output type, which is itself. So the deserialized trait can only ever output itself. Um, so in this case, the visitor can only produce this one too. Um, as mentioned earlier, deserialize any is not always supported. This is what the three different types of formats look like that Serdy can roughly work with. So the first is um, what's called a self-describing and human readable format. Both of those concepts are called this way in 30. Um, I don't know if they're generally um, terms that are used. Um, self-describing means um, you can take an input like a JSON document, and even without knowing anything about the schema, you can make sense of it. Uh, human readable means that, well, it's more or less ASCII kind of thing. The second example, this is message pack, which is also self-describing. So it, it, you can translate this to JSON and back, and it will more or less look the same. Um, but it's not human readable because it obviously involves a bunch of binary stuff. And the last one, which is probably not as easy to see, um, is that this is a non-self-describing format. And this is sort of a packed binary representation where you have to know that the first thing you're going to decode is key one. Um, and so the only thing that the format tells you is like, OK, the next five bytes are value, which is sort of the value to key one. Um, and then the next five bytes, again, are in this case, actually, this format kind of assumes that this is a tuple of two items. So it says, again, there's going to be a string of five bytes called value. And then there's going to be the, uh, uh, the one byte value number two. Um, and obviously here, the, the, the problem is that if you don't know what you're, dis what you're decoding, then um, you can't make any sense of it. So you have to understand the schema so that you can parse this. Um, and the deserializer support in 30 can support all of those cases. What we're going to look at in this talk is actually only going to be self-describing. Um, Non-self-describing formats in 30 are supported well by 30, but they're not supported well by the ecosystem. Um, this has also quite a bit to do with buffering. Um, 
when you, for instance, take JSON, you have no guarantee in which order the keys are coming in. So there's no guarantee that key one comes before key two. So um, for a deserializer, it's actually better to just parse the whole thing and then rearrange these keys to sort of what's expected rather than to assume that the first value is going to come in is going to be key one. Um, and for a non-self-describing format, you can actually assume perfect ordering. OK, so that's the boring part. Let's see what we can actually do with this. Um, so I have two things I want to show. The first one, and both of them are um, related to sort of libraries I wrote. Um, but I'm, I wasn't the first one sort of discovered this or used this. So the first thing is um, you can use Serby to implement runtime type systems. Um, this is what I use this for. I have a Rust re-implementation of my Jinja template engine. Um, it doesn't do everything that the Python version does, but it, it comes relatively close, I would say. Uh, it's called mini Jinja because it only has 30 as a dependency. So everything else is entirely optional. Um, so this is what this looks like. Um, you Effectively, this is the API, what it looks like. So you, you create this environment object. And then you parse and compile a template by adding it to this environment. And then when you call this context method, um, or sorry, the context macro, you're basically creating like a, a, an object on the spot here, which is just a 30 serializable object, which basically says like there's a key called name and there's a value called John. And then it invokes render. And what's important is that I don't have to have the name John. I could have a complex object for as long as it can serialize. And then basically going to pass this in sort of the template engine. And then in the template engine, you can, it's like a programming language. You can do stuff with it. You can add numbers. You can call methods. You can, you can change it, convert it between types, um, everything that you would expect. And so basically, for this templating engine internally, there has to be a runtime representation of the values because like until you run this, you don't know what's in there. And for this to work, I'm basically using 30. Um, internally in the evaluator, this has nothing to do with 30, but I think it's important to understand. In the evaluator, you have basically a bytecode uh, interpreter. And so every instruction is a bytecode instruction. And based on that, it does something. And what you can see here is store local is, for instance, the instruction to store the top of the stack in, uh, in a variable of a specific name. So in this case, it pops for store local, it pops the top value from the stack, the stack machine, and then it stores it in the local variable called name. Um, for lookup, it does the inverse. It tries to look up a variable with a specific name in, in, in the current uh, context. And then if it doesn't find it, it returns undefined. And then get adder is kind of similar. You take the top value from the stack, and then you look up an attribute with a specific name. And as you can see, value.getAtter is sort of a method that exists on the um, on the value trait, so sorry, on the value type, so that it can actually do dynamic lookup. So how does this work in the engine? Um, so this is an example from, from change of templates. So you have a for loop. So it goes for every user in the list of users. It wants to render this. And the interesting part here is actually, I don't know if anyone is familiar with the Chincha template engine, but Chincha gives it a secret variable called loop. And loop refers to the loop itself. Um, so as you're iterating over your, uh, your sequence or your iterable, behind the scenes, the loop also exists. And it gives you access to. For instance, the current index of the iteration, or it gives you access to the length of the iterator. And one of the things that Ginger also always provided was this loop, uh, the cycle method. And this is also what I implemented here. So on the loop context, there's a cycle method, and it can give it multiple parameters. And so on first iteration, it will return odd. On second iteration, it will return even. On the third iteration, it will return odd. So it basically just takes this input, and it, it does modulo loop index. Um, so what does this have to do with 30? Well, what it has to do with 30 is that this loop object um, has to exist in this runtime type system that we have. So the input to the engine is a bunch of 30 compatible types. So what are 30 compatible types? Integers, strings, lists, structs, um, options, um, 
but that's pretty much it. Um, tuples two, but for instance, Serdi doesn't have a concept of well file handles. Serdi doesn't have a concept of arbitrary Rust objects. So what doesn't exist in a Serdi type system cannot go through a serializer. So a serializer can only visit into the structure of something. So if you, for instance, take the loop, so the loop has state on it, like index, length, and so forth. But you cannot serialize the loop. Um, you could only serialize the current state of the loop, but you can't pass the loop through serialize, deserialize. Um, but this is actually what's necessary for this system here to work in, uh, in the templating engine a little bit. And I will explain why later. But the, the second part that's kind of more obvious is that uh, this is a method on it, right? So um, how does this work? Um, internally in the engine, um, it's again the same. There's a method on it, like get adder. There's a method on it called call method. Um, and so you can call a method on a value. Um, this is what happens if you enter the loop. And I think this sort of starts going a little bit into what the problem is. When the engine starts executing a loop, so it, it enters the loop, it pushes the current loop context on top of the stack. Um, and the only thing that we care about here is actually this loop state. So loop state is this loop variable. So we have the current index on it and the current length of the iteration. And as you can see, we, we wrap it in an arc, so an uh, atomic reference counted uh, wrapper. And actually, there's, there's already sort of a curious part. You cannot out of the box serialize uh, a loop controller um, in Serdi, even if loop state is serializable, because arc is not serializable out of the box usually. You can make Serdi serialize arcs, but um, we we don't care about this right now. Um, it, it, it will work for us. Um, but what you can see here is that we are, we are wrapping this loop state. Um, and we are saying like one reference here actually goes onto this frame. And then later, we can actually sort of hold onto this reference in other places too, which we will do. So loop state then refers to what this loop variable was earlier. And I can show you how this happens, but it's not so important. What's more important is that um, we have a custom trait in MiniChanger called object. And this object is used by anything that's sort of dynamic. And so object is obviously implemented for loop state. And one of the things that it has is a call method callback, which is what we called earlier. And so like, OK, I want the name of a method. Um, and then the arguments passed to that method. And every argument is, again, this value object. So value is really just this runtime type object that we're using everywhere, which is serializable. And so if we're trying to call the cycle method, then we're loading the current index. We're looking up in the argument list um, index modal argument length. Um, so we're basically cycling through. And then we return this argument cloned. So value is clonable. Why is value clonable? Well, because everything in there is reference counted. So values can be relatively cheaply copied. Um, so this is roughly what this looks like, right? So when the engine goes, say, loop dots, if the user goes loop dot cycle, why is some sort of indirection it calls into this here? Uh, and it will do whatever is, is done here. Um, if you try to call any other method on it, you're going to end up in the second branch, which tells you there's no method named this. So value is basically a reference counted object that utilizes interior mutability. And more importantly, um, it can hold data that someone else also modifies at the same time, right? So um, in, the, in the sort of where the user interacts with the template engine, there's this loop object, a bunch of other stuff. But while this is happening, the engine itself holds also on to the loop context to do some modification. So when you, for instance, iterate, so you're, if the engine wants to iterate one step forward, then it in increments the index of the loop controller by one. It fetches the next item from the iterator. It pushes the item on the stack. And if it, it, if it reached the end, it will actually just jump to the exit condition of the loop. So the controller here is modified by the engine. At the same time, um, someone else can hold on to the controller. So you can, for instance, imagine that someone would reassign the loop variable to another variable and the engine. So then you have like two pointers to the same loop controller. Uh, sort of two handles to the same controller. So inter interior mutability is happening over there. So, but how, what does this have to do with serialization? And 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 how do you actually serialize the loop controller? Um, 
So value has to be serializable. Um, why does it have to be serializable? Because I might pass out the value from this sort of template engine into some other callback context. And someone might want to then again pass this to another template. And then it has to go into the serialization system again. So how can it pass through these internal abstractions if Serdy doesn't allow me to pass data through that doesn't follow its own object model, right? So if you can imagine, I could take my loop context and I serialize it into index and length. But then the internal template just sees a dictionary of, of index and length. It doesn't see a loop control anymore. So if that template, for instance, through inheritance or something like this, wants to modify or interact with the loop, uh, it will not find these methods anymore. So the answer to this is, uh, is very ugly. It involves thread local storage and in-band signaling. Um, so this is, this is how this works. And this is why it's kind of ugly. But unfortunately, there's no significantly better way in SERDI today. Um, but it kind of works. Basically, we use a combination of thread local storage and embed signaling to, see, to communicate non SERDI data outside of the main SERDI sort of communication format from serialized to serializer. Um, what we do is we there's um, a special internal reserved string, which starts with some binary, um, which says, like, if, I, if you see this around later, this doesn't refer to what it would refer to normally. Um, and then we keep some thread locals. The first thread local that we hold is just a bool that says, are we serializing internally? Um, if this is false, then it means someone is serializing my value to JSON, for instance. If this is true, then we are serializing for MiniGenture itself. So when MiniGenture tries to serialize for its own uses, it will flip this to true. So this means that any code that serializes can decide if it wants to serialize for JSON, where it would serialize the loop context as you would expect as an object, or if it wants to serialize for mini changer, where it wants to keep the original value and just bump the reference count. Then we have a last value handle, which is just a counter that goes up into infinity. And then we have a stashing area where we associate every handle with um, the value that it points to. And then we just have a helper function to figure out if we're internally serializing. So this is the marker. This is where the values are stashed. Um, and these two things are the most important ones. So when we serialize a value, so this is this serialized implemented for, for value itself. If you are in internal serialization, so that means mini chincha wants to serialize data for itself. We get a new handle by just incrementing the count on this TLS. Then we stash onto that handle ID a clone of ourselves. Then we serialize a struct named value handle marker. That was this sort of weird uh, binary one under under mini changer under value handle. Um, and then we serialize a single field called handle. And then we end the whole thing. So we basically compress our handle ID into a little bit of structure that is then internally referenced what? by the code. Oh, that's for mama. One second. Okay. So it's it's serialized for itself. And on deserializing, but I need to figure this out again, right? So this is where it ends up in this uh, value handles, and then on the way back in the deserializer. Uh, or it's not in the deserializer, in sort of the struct serializer, we, um, in, we basically, whenever we then find, in our own serializer, whenever we find structs, so when we collect these structs as we did earlier, we actually now look if the struct name is our value handle marker. And if it's the value handle marker, we take the handle field of that struct extract the handle ID out of it, and then look in the TLS if we're in there. And this sort of really bizarre dance that we are doing here lets us um, pass through the original value unchanged through multiple layers of serialized, deserialized in the engine. So why do we do all of this? Um, 
So one example for this is we need first class functions um, in mini Jinja to support what Jinja is actually doing. So this is this is valid Jinja and mini Jinja code where you say like, okay, I have a function called cycler, which returns an object, which has, which is callable. And whenever you call it, it returns the next value. So first it will return odd, then it will return even, then return odd, even, and, and so forth. And for this, function to exist in the runtime, it has to be serializable. And so this is what this looks like. Um, we have a function called make cycler, which returns a value from this object, right? And so if you look at value from object, this creates a value that internally holds onto the cycler, which has to be, uh, it has to implement object. And then I can stash it into the global scope with env add function. And this basically just does nothing else but boxing the function and storing it. Um, and the funny thing with this is that from the engine's perspective, I have now the ability to store any artificial additional data in it. And I can go through any layer of indirection in 30 um, without having to build my own object system on top. Um, so for instance, I'm using this not only to hold onto dynamic objects and functions, uh, in mini Chincha, I also hold on to special types of strings that are exactly like strings, but have additional meta information so that I can do something useful with it. So for instance, in a lot of template engines, including Chincha, there's a difference between a string and a string that has already been HTML escaped. Because if a string is already HTML escaped, then I don't have to HTML escape it again. Um, and so I have sort of two string types internally even though the original 30 can only have one single string type. The sort of idea of using in-band signaling is actually something that even 30 itself uses. So the 30 JSON uh, support has support for arbitrary precision integers. So integers that are significantly bigger than 128. Um, and it uses exactly the same system internally to stash large strings as large numbers and it also uses this, this ugly in-band signaling. So ideally, there would be a better way to do this, um, but you can kind of do this anyways by using TLS. It's ugly, but it works. But it only works for as long as your serialize and your serializer cooperate. So um, if you were to serialize a value not to serialize this internal, so if you, if you were to serialize a value object not to, uh, to mini changes internal serializer, but for instance, to YAML or to JSON, then um, none of this would work, right? Because like it wouldn't know how to grab this stuff from 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 TLS. So we would actually leak this out um, if we were to 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 go through this code path. And this is why we have to figure out: do we serialize to mini change or do we serialize to something else? Another kind of interesting thing you can do with this is sort of this idea of IPC auxiliary data. Auxiliary data. So what this this little create sort of experimental is called Unix IPC. And it lets you pass data from one process to another. And what's kind of odd about Unix IPC is that Unix lets you send bytes through a socket. But if you send between processes, you can attach extra data on the side, which are um, file handles. So you can, for instance, pass a file or a socket from one process to another process. Um, and it's all well and good, but unfortunately, um, with a higher level abstraction, it can become really unwieldy to do this. Um, so you can, for instance, imagine that you might have a description of a, of a task that you want to do. And this task involves um, like some input data. And you want to pass this input data to another process. But sometimes you also have to pass really large things like sockets that you don't want to reopen in the subprocess. So for instance, when, you're, uh, when you implement something like a web server, the socket is already open. So now you want to pass the socket to a subprocess so the subprocess can, when it's done with its stuff, just directly send the data to the socket. Um, and so I was playing with this idea of making abstraction over 30 to send file handles between processes. So how do you pass this? Um, I don't know if you're familiar with, um, with Unix IPC, but there's a call called send MSG, which as a first argument basically takes the bytes and a second argument takes its ancillary data. Um, and so my idea was you can write a 30 abstraction where a 30 doesn't just produce data, 
it also collects file pointers. Um, and so this is what I wanted to do. So I wanted that you can derive serialize and deserialize on a struct, which is, for instance, task. Um, and in this case, the, the first argument, the first field on, this, on the task is a TCP stream. But because TCP stream obviously is not serializable, I have to wrap it in a new type, which is called handle. And this makes anything that has a Unix file, uh, file descriptor serializable. And the second thing is like a task payload. And so this is what I want to do is I want my sub process, I want to connect to my parent process, create a receiver, and I want to receive one handle, as I saw in this case, actually task. So this should be not, it should not be let handle, it should be let task. So I receive one task, then I want to compute the result on the task payload, and I want to send the result directly into the socket that I also received on the task. Right? That's sort of the goal that I want to do. Um, so basic goal idea is figure out a way to serialize and deserialize the task. But whenever you encounter a file handle, um, just put it somewhere else. So this is how serialize is implemented for handle and handle ref. Handle ref is basically an internal thing that's almost like handle, but um, it, it works slightly different. It, it has to do with one consumes the file descriptor and the other one um, just holds a reference to it. So in this case, when it serializes, it checks, am I in IPC mode? This is, again, the same logic as I did in mini Ginger. There's a thread local variable that says true if we're serializing for IPC and false otherwise. Um, so if we're in IPC mode, then we take the file descriptor, which is on ourselves. We register the file descriptor on a thread local variable. We serialize the integer of no longer the file descriptor, but the index in our FD array with the serializer. So um, originally, you, for instance, had like, uh, say, FD45 in there, which was the socket. Now it serializes 0 and puts FD45 into an array in TLS. Um, on Yeah, so it stashes away in TLS. And then on the way back, um, this is the deserialize for, um, in this case, well, I didn't actually put the deserialize in here, unfortunately. So, but the deserialize basically does the same. It it deserializes an integer, and then it does lookup FD to find the FD in um, in TLS again, and then get it out from there. And this is what this looks like if you send it, for instance. So, on sending, um, it serializes my original input, the task, for instance, into bytes. And instead of getting just out bytes, like you would do in, in 30 normally, um, you get out the payload and the file descriptors independently. Um, I'm actually not sure where my slide went that has this in there. But um, what you can imagine how this looks like is that I stash away an empty vector on TLS. I'm putting my, um, my file descriptors into this array every time I'm encountering a handle. And then at the end of it, I just pick them up and serialize. And then I can send them independently as payload first argument and FD is a second argument. And that's all there is to it. So um, I know this is a lot. Um, but you can find some of the code that, uh, that drives this uh, on my GitHub. Um, and there's also a blog post that goes with it on my blog, which is linked here, um, which um, explains this a little bit more in detail. I think what's interesting about using Serdi like this is that because Serdi is so universally used all over the place, there's actually quite a bit you can leverage with it, even if it's really sort of out of the ordinary. You have to imagine that there's almost every single type in Rust is serializable. And so there's a, a big ecosystem that you can use. If I were, for instance, to want to write a template engine, where in order to use an object in the template engine, you would have to implement my own trait, then I couldn't leverage a lot of the traits and a lot of the objects in the ecosystem. But because almost everything is already compatible, I can basically build on top of that. OK.